today's fellow seminar, and it's on digitizing cannabis history, hegemony, and opportunities. Uh, and it's going to be by Dr. Prasenji Tribhuvan. Uh, you know, Dr. Tribhuvan, first of all, I want to formally welcome you to IIAS because normally what happens is that whenever a new fellow joins, in the very next uh, academic activity after his or her joining, you know, we introduce the fellow and uh, he or she says something about themselves, their projects, their work. But because of COVID, we're not able to do that. So instead, we postpone introducing a fellow to the time that they actually make their first presentation. So this is going to uh, serve two purposes. We'll obviously be presenting your work, but before that, I want to formally welcome you to the IIA Fellows Community. Thank you. Thank you, we sir. Met, yeah, we already met for a cup of tea, but uh, I, I want to say this once again on behalf of uh, the entire extended IIA family. Welcome. We are very happy to have you with us. And uh, to the other fellows, I want to just uh, go back uh, to the interview that uh, Dr. Tribhuvan gave, where uh, you know, the very mention of the word cannabis had set some, you know, <laughs> alarm bells ringing to, to an extent. And I said, well, this is the kind of work that we should welcome because it's unusual, it's creative, it's interdisciplinary, and uh, uh, it has much scope for exploration. And when it comes to HP, we all know that, uh, you know, HP is facing a sort of drug crisis with Chitta, you know, a kind of uh, slightly less refined version of uh, cocaine, something like brown sugar. I don't know what it is. I haven't seen it, let alone tried it, but what one reads about it. But this brings us actually to the heart of the matter. I, I mean, I'll request Samandeep Ji to uh, chair this session and formally introduce uh, Dr. Tribhuvan, but I just wanted to say that uh, I find him uh, a very fascinating person. He's into uh, heavy metal music, and uh, and he's interested in in uh, the beat generation. You know, people like uh, you know Allen Ginsberg and Jack Kerouac and a whole lot of people who were deeply influenced by India. Some of them came to India also. In addition to being an anthropologist, I think he's also a software engineer. So this is the sort of uh, background that uh, you know makes for very interesting and creative work. But but really to come back to the to the topic for a moment, uh, you know, the the fundamental question that Dr. Prasenjit asks is how do we decolonize uh, cannabis, which is ganja, you know. Uh, hashish, ganja, and so forth. And he starts by saying he has a quotation from decolonizing methodology, methodologies from a Maori uh, activist and critic. And uh, he asks post-colonial, when did they leave, you know? Now, I've done a little bit of work on this whole, uh, what should I say, the politics of the post, for lack of better word. And the problem with the post is that it's uh, it's, it's a kind of hold-all term, you know. It hides so much more than it actually reveals. So post-colonial can be neo-colonial, it can be uh, anti-colonial, or it can be simply post in the way we say something comes after something. So, you know, these three very obvious meanings aside, the post hides, as I said, so many possibilities, you know, and uh, it can also be, you know, somebody was saying, you know, with the word Orientalism. Now we're, uh, people say maybe it's reorientalism. You know, it's not just Orientalism, but reorientalism. So basically, the question I want to raise is that, you know, when we want to, let's say, decriminalize cannabis, let's say, just to take up that point, which is the topic today. Perhaps it's not a form of decolonization, but, you know, we are also responding to the move to decriminalize cannabis, you know, which is happening in many parts of the world, not just in Amsterdam, where we know uh, that it's easily available, but several parts of the United States, for, for example. In other words, 
first we criminalize it you know under the colonial ages and then when they start to decriminalize it we also copy them there so that's that we, we are still following you know we're still following in their footsteps and so the first question i had is is there any easy or painless way to reconnect with our pre-colonial past uh, i'm not sure there is because when we uh, want to return to that uh, past uh, it doesn't seem to be a simple return that's my point because as i said even in de- even in wanting to decriminalize we're still following their lead in criminalizing also we followed their lead so we are still trapped it would seem uh, in that kind of relationship of subordination and dominance but if you think about it the management of pain in some ways is really you know the progress of civilization and in our traditional societies whether it's opium or cannabis or all these substances i think prasenjit ji calls it material so i want to ask what's the difference between material and substance i'm coming to that in a moment but all had their place all had their place even tobacco yesterday professor raju was talking about tobacco when you say let's smoke the peace pipe had a very exalted role in native uh, you know american culture so all these substances what i'm trying to say had a well defined established and respected role in, in fact the word assassin comes from hashish hashishim so what i'm trying to say is when colonial come colonialism enters then you have the opium wars then you have a different it's not management of pain but management of addiction you might say so that takes us into a different direction altogether how to how to profit from addiction and even today if you go to singapore you know a country like singapore which is supposed to be so liberal you can't you can't import to singapore something as simple as poppy seeds which bengalis use in cooking poshto i don't know you know those who like a, a, a particular potato preparation you know it needs khaskhas it needs those seeds and that's banned so we're talking about a complicated issue i'm going to turn it over to samandeep ji in a moment i just wanted to mention one line that uh, struck me in the abstract you know uh, he says the presentation will discuss how the silence of material objects has kept them away from the decolonizing gaze of the intellectualism of the global south the silence of material objects i i love that sentence and i just wanted to say a word on it now what is the difference between material objects and substances you know as i already said because for me cannabis weed this is not just a material object it's something very living it's a part of nature first of all so it's not some dead material object you know first of all but more than that when we say the silence of material objects what do we mean because you know all of us let's say a painting we look at a painting and we say oh the painting is speaking to me you know so material objects are not silent they speak to us you know and uh, the only question is how do we give them voice uh, so let let's turn it over to dr prasenjit prabhuan so that he gives voice uh to cannabis over to you sir and welcome once again to ias amandeep ji please take it away from here thank you so much i'm muting my mic thank you sir thank you so much so uh, i welcome dr prasenjit here and uh, i welcome you to the institute as well and uh, he sent me his uh, bio so uh, i'll formally introduce him he is currently uh, an assistant professor of sociology at iit jodhpur and uh, uh, he completed his phd from department of sociology delhi school of economics and he uh, uh, his phd project was also related to this uh, uh, what uh, he is pre- going to present today only uh, on this issue of cannabis so as far as the topic is concerned i think uh, uh director sir has already introduced a lot but still i would like to read a few lines from uh, his bio which he has sent and wrote some lines on his uh, topic also 
so uh, in this uh, the the project uh, the title of the project is uh, decolonizing cannabis history hegemony and opportunities with a special focus on himalayas so uh, in this project he is studying how colonial legacy persists in the erstwhile colonies and uh, uh, which is uh, which has influenced the material culture of those colonies and in this context the material culture refers to uh, cannabis and uh, so uh, he'll be talking in detail about the different dimensions of decolonizing cannabis and what kind of influence this material culture has on uh, these these colonies so i'll uh, uh, invite dr uh, prasanjit to make his presentation uh, there are some questions already coming to my mind but i'll ask these questions later on so i welcome him and invite him to make his presentation over to you please okay uh, thank you uh, director sir and thank you uh, dr sumandeep for your uh, for the introduction and uh, uh, thank you again i'm uh, very humbled so uh, uh, I'll, I'll i'll start my presentation uh, uh, so i have a presentation i have a, a slide but that is more of a directive I, that just to uh, uh, go through what i will be going through i'll be mostly uh, uh, you know uh, reading through a little bit from my presentation and i will also uh, in between i will explain as to what i uh, will uh, what i mean by certain things and uh, later of course i mean uh, i'm looking forward to the feedback uh, because this is just the start of my work here so 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 yeah uh, so so we'll start with what uh, uh, you know what what do we mean by material agency and what do we mean by uh, humility of objects or a silence of objects so uh, so when we as social researchers or uh, researchers of for human condition uh, study communities uh, societies and nations the crux of our studies uh, for a long time have been people and ideas uh, the non human uh, materials, substances, objects, and even animals uh, have to a great extent uh, been relegated to the back seats of things that interest academic minds. Uh, the reasons uh, behind this have been many, uh, but to point of two major ones. Uh, one, uh, material objects have lost out to outwardly more interesting world of human uh, emotions, ideas, and actions. And gradually through the years, they simply fell out of the gamut of things to study uh, by the mentally gifted. And second, uh, the, the nature of objects and the way they affect us obfuscates of, 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 of them from our intellectual gaze. Uh, uh, the Miller, uh, I mean, Daniel Miller refers to this phenomenon as the humility of objects. That is, it basically means that objects have power over us because we are so used to them. And while they are ubiquity, gives them their influence, ironically, it also hides them as actors who exert this influence. So, so the thing is objects, materials are, uh, uh, hide themselves from our uh, analysis because, especially from social analysis, mainly because they are everywhere. Like if you if you go to, uh, coming back to my particular substance, coming back to cannabis, if you go to Kullu Valley, the moment Kulu Valley starts, you will see that cannabis plants are almost everywhere because they grow wildly uh, in those particular areas. Even in even in Shimla, for that matter, they used to grow wildly. Uh, but what I have learned is that uh, Shimla being the capital of Himachal, uh, once cannabis became illegal in 1986, uh, it was uh, all the plants were uprooted and they were uprooted to such an extent that uh, they didn't uh, ever grow, grow back. And then there's a myth, there's a saying in Shimla that... Uh, uh, since cannabis is supposed to be Lord Shiva's uh, favorite herb, that uh, once you uproot cannabis, uh, it uh, it doesn't grow back because it uh, it is you know it uh, it feels bad you know it's one, once uh, uh, once it turns its back on you, it will never grow back. And and quite frankly, when you look around Shimla, uh, we hardly find cannabis plants over here, which is which is kind of strange because all uh, all in other places which are near to Shimla, we, we find cannabis growing freely. So, anyways, uh, so we'll uh, go ahead. So this is what humility, the term uh, humility of objects actually means uh, that objects, uh, we didn't study material objects and their influence on us mainly because of their ubiquity, because they are common. Yeah. And <clears throat> so if the, if the world were a stage, uh, I'm referring to Goffman here when he says, if the world were a, were a stage, objects provide the background which enframes the happenings on this stage. Always present, always influential, however, hardly conspicuous. Historically, some objects are able to break out of this backdrop and emerge as overt actors. Now, one of the examples of this is sugar. 
Uh, so Sydney Mins in his work uh, called Sweetness and Power, he talks about how sugar uh, uh, um, changed certain parts of the world to a great extent, right? Uh, and again, uh, colonization and imperialism uh, uh, plays uh, plays a great part again in this in the sugar story also. So what happened was uh, when uh, uh, when when Britain especially. Uh, uh, came across uh, islands uh, near Jamaica, like near, near the present West Indies, they, they they saw that it had lots of land and there was lots of opportunity to grow sugar cane, right? And uh, once you have so much land and once you have so much sugar, uh, what happened was whatever sugar was produced, uh, Britain found out that the world as such did not consume as much sugar as it is now producing, right? So one at one place, you have this land and you have slaves who, who are working for you and who are growing sugarcane for you because that land is so and and the weather in the west end is is, is very much you know it's, it's it's so good for uh, uh, for growing sugar and for producing sugar and on the other hand you have uh, this particular uh, problem that you hardly any of uh, i mean sugar was always considered as a luxury product even in india although india did produce sugar but it was a luxury product we also used honey uh, more uh, for sweetening uh, now what happens after that is that since you produce so many sugar and you don't have any consumers, uh, the, the British started to push sugar into all of their colonies because they wanted to create consumers for sugar. So, so what we have here is, uh, we have at one point, the, the habit of most of the colonial world now changing from honey and into like, you know, this, in, into this new sweetening agent. So that's why sweet becomes such a big, uh, uh, you know, it, it becomes such a big adjective and sweet becomes, it, it's, it's, it becomes such an important taste, right? So what we have is that one particular uh, material object, one particular substance basically changing the way world eats, right? And uh, and how imperialism, colonial, uh, colonialism, slavery, uh, uh, labor, all of this, you know, uh, take part in this particular process and and that is when and that is when particular objects right they they come out into the foreground they they no they no more are relegated into the background sugar is one such object as uh, sydney mix finds out uh, gold is one such object and in latin america cocaine is uh, is, is one of those objects that, that you know uh, that, that sort of uh, no more remain in the background. No, they they no more just remain at the background of the world stage they become actors themselves so so yeah uh, so these objects uh, transcend their traditional role as their influence brings them to the foreground, making them a topic of intellectual deliberations. They are successful in bringing their whole object kind into the foreground for some time so that we can look at them as explicit actors or what Bruno Latour and others call agents or simply actants. An agent is any entity that influences our being in this world. In that sense, all material objects are agents. However, it takes certain special objects to bring all of its kind uh, uh, out of academic anonymity. I use the word academic year because in social life, we have always understood the significance of objects, but have hardly acknowledged their existence in our intellectual lives. Uh, <clears throat> so yeah, so cannabis sativa, I, I come to my particular object. Uh, cannabis sativa, the plant that provides raw material for organic intoxicants like ganja, Charas, bhang, etc., is a material agent or a material actor than par excellence in many regions of India. Its capture of the public imagination and its presence in public sphere in both physical and discursive forms is a testimony to that. Uh, my PhD research shows that cannabis engenders large scale social transformation in some big regions of the Indian Himalayas. I borrowed Tosik's term to educate cannabis in these regions as a transgressive object one that transgresses socio-political, cultural, and legal boundaries to affect every aspect of human life, right? My main area was Kullu district, and it so happens also in the Kangra district, in some parts of the Kangra district, where cannabis becomes a transgressive object, right? Uh, which basically transgresses every aspect of human life and becomes a part of your everyday life. Uh, in the last couple of decades, uh, cannabis has been significantly responsible in transforming local economy challenging socio-cultural order and influencing individual life trajectories in parts of the Indian Himalayas. If we look at a material history of cannabis in Himalayas, we'll find that this ascent of cannabis, cannabis's influence has only been recent. An indigenous crop, cannabis and its parts have been traditionally used for food, clothing and enjoyment in form of socially consumed intoxicant. It has been a humble object, ubiquitous, useful, 
harmful to some extent, but never as influential as it is now. Uh, the question how a humble object became trans transgressive begs an answer, and on further inquiry, we find that the most significant part of this answer revolves around the moral slash legal framework that today regular cannabis that today regulates cannabis. The scope and objective of my work at IIS is very much informed by this realization. Processes of imperialism, uh, we can include uh, 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 colonialism, globalization, and, and the way science works, coerced in different ways to produce discourses on cannabis, mainly through a frame framework of law, and often other aspects of cannabis use, misuse, and its place in social practice and culture were co-opted by a larger legal, illegal narrative. This narrative is produced and driven by the West and the knowledge produced on cannabis in countries like India, where it has been domesticated for centuries, is only used to take sides or to strengthen a particular position in the debate. So what happens is that every aspect of our culture, uh, you know, every aspect of social practice that revolved around cannabis, it has only been used as a debate, somehow as an addition to a debate to maybe legalize cannabis or maybe to make cannabis illegal. And, and, and the way cannabis is defined, the way cannabis is explained to us is only through this uh, framework of, uh, of the legal slash uh, illegal narrative. And this brings to the to my uh, to objective of my work at IISS and you know uh, the scope of my work. So so my work intends to modify the framework through which cannabis is known to us, and study cannabis through a perspective that does not prioritize uh, illegality as its main defining property. The proposed work will study cannabis from a new epistemological stance, one that favors an endocentric view of cannabis and its products. The main objective here is to decolonize, uh, I mean, for a want of better word, cannabis by producing knowledge through a framework that does not adhere to dominant cultural interpretations of cannabis, which are mainly patronized by the global West. My work proposes to develop a methodology to achieve such a decolonization of cannabis in particular and material culture in general and study the implications of such a reclaiming of material objects on a larger pro uh, project of decolonizing epistemology. The work will also further explore socioeconomic opportunities that cannabis presents to us today, keeping in mind that important criteria of ecological sustainability uh, with a special focus on Himalayan regions of the country. The attempt here will be to study cannabis as an important material and cultural substance beyond the binary of legal and illegal. Yeah. So I, I, I keep using this uh, uh, term uh, decolonization. And so I thought that, you know, since it's my introductory presentation, I might as well, you know, address what what decolonization means, although I, I'm sure like many, most of us know. But still, uh, physically, uh, decolonization would entail the withdrawing of colonial past from geographical boundaries of a territory. However, legacies of imperialism, of which colonialism is a subset, continue to persist long after colonial powers withdraw from the territory. Here, the quote that I use at the start of the abstract holds prominence. Uh, Post-colonialism, post post -colonialism, when did they leave? Probably some sub the staying power of colo colonial slash imperial legacies. The capturing of political, economic, and cultural power by the countries of the global West for centuries is bound to leave a bad aftertaste in the minds and the hearts of the colonized. As scholars of post-colonial theory often point out, colonial legacies persist through ideas, cultures, and social practice. The reification of social strat stratification, which was earlier flexible to some extent in colonized society, ex exponential increase in consumerism, ecological destruction, separation of communities, body, mind, and soul from ecology are all lasting colonial legacies that cause immense suffering to this day. And they continue to cause uh, immense suffering to this day. The most disastrous aspect of this lingering of legacies is that this phenomenon is insidious in nature. As Harshankar Parsai points out in a couple of his stories, harmful ideas are not devastating, are, are most devastating when they are internalized. And that is when they become a part of our lives without us realizing their influence on the ways we think. In other words, uh, imperial legacy persists through cultural hegemony, and that's when it becomes most influential and most devastating. Hence, the first step of decolonization is to delineate those ideas which we have internalized as a part of, an, of living in an unequal world structure. 
only after we identify that certain ideas and practices are a result of unequal power structures can we do something about it. Once the first step is realized, we can move on to actually reclaim ideas and social practice, which will help us to recreate a just dignified society, which is almost always the aim of decolonization. Now, as Dr. Rabindra Ray, uh, Professor Pranza and others have pointed out that M.K. Gandhi's Hind Swaraj is one of the earliest texts that, that to a great extent uh, delineates a sort of method towards decolonization of ideas and practices, right? Gandhi's synthesis of the concept of Swaraj in this regard stands out, stands out. But Swaraj is not as same, same as self-rule. Rather, it tries to distance itself from the individualism of selfhood and uses indigenous ideas to come up with a vision of governance that is both homegrown, but at the same time does not totally ignore West knowledge about this particular subject. Yeah. So, so, so the way you know the decolonization and its methods have been explained, have been have been very well explained by by certain uh, personalities, uh, but they remain in the again they remain in the in this area of ideas and emotions, right? What I a great part of my thought in this regard will go into what I foresee uh, 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 in this project uh, will go into adapting some of these methods and some of these thoughts into synthesizing a process of decolonizing objects, right? So, so there's a decolonization of ideas, there's decolonization of concepts, and now we, we are coming to decolonization of materials. Uh, the first question, so the first question with this regard to, so I've talked, spoken about decolonization. So what does colonization of material objects mean, right? Now, some uh, what studies pointed out, colonization of material objects was basically this process where colonial entities, uh, where colonial powers, uh, And uh, they take objects from there and, and they basically rob those objects from the, those particular social contexts and they exploit those objects for capital, uh, for gaining capital, right? So what, what happened, especially with cannabis, I mean, one of the cannabis and even, even other objects was that uh, the Britishers and, and even other uh, European powers, they came into India, they saw some potential, some profit potential from this particular object took this object to their own country, took this object to the US, took this object to the other lands. However, they didn't take the social context with them, right? What the next step is that once you don't have social concept or context, what you do is you start fetishizing those objects, right? And by fetishizing, you mean is like, uh, you know, there are so many ways to fetishize an object, like uh, uh, like there are so many books written in, uh, in, uh, in 16th century about cannabis, uh, in French as well as in English, which, which eulogize cannabis and, it, and this, but it's this magical, you know, substance that they bring from India and how, uh, you know, uh, um, I mean, it's 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 it's, it's how uh, Orientalism basically worked. Right? They, uh, I mean, for them, India was always a magical land, and then they get this magical substance which gets you high, right? And uh, with magic, uh, then gradually turns into uh, into suspicion, right? And now this is how I mean, this is how uh, fetishization works, right? Because you don't know you you are uh, what you do is you don't uh, respect the socio cultural context from which you have brought those objects from. You only exploit uh, the materiality of that object for your own gain, and then you start eulogizing and fetishizing that objects that object, and uh, and construct your own discourse around it. So 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 that is one of the part of how uh, objects can be colonized. So, 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 so basically, this is uh, this is what uh, decolonization, colonization, uh, uh, meant uh, means to me, and uh, this is what I want to do. I want to, you know, uh, decolonize uh, material objects by learning from the principles of how this process have been otherwise uh, otherwise used uh, in other fields. And uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, I have great many uh, like you know, th th there are so many people who have done this. So, so from this, I I come ahead to to, to just uh, uh, you know it's uh, reading out my hypothesis. So, so what 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 my hypothesis was? So, the processes of imperialism transform some material object within so, so colonized societies with respect to their cultural interpretation and use and social status. My work proposes that these objects as as act as medium through which colonial legacy persists in formal colonies through social belief and practice. 
cannabis is one such object and tracing his journey from being a commodity uh, from from being a commonly used humble herb in large parts of india to its present status as an illegal narcotic with reasonable potential to destroy individual lives and society will help us understand how imperial legacies continue to sustain western hegemony through material culture the work also proposes that the larger project of decolonization has much to gain from decolonizing of material culture in india and cannabis is a significant object in this regard so um yeah so so i think uh, this is uh, this is where i uh, uh, you know this is what i propose to do uh, this is i also discuss some of my uh, theoretical framework and uh, you know and uh, discuss some concept that i thought will be useful for us uh, while uh, when uh, i mean when i explain uh, this project to you i will uh, i will finally i'll just conclude uh, i mean it's it's a long conclusion just by you know uh, just by um uh, by, uh, i mean what i see uh, as the significance of this particular work i mean i, I mean you know the significance of uh, and, and and the kind of contribution that i hope to make uh, so so this work endeavors to make a contribution to the discipline of post colonial studies and material anthropology uh, as i have mentioned post colonial theory studies how former colonies and their inhabitants engage with colonial legacies and struggle in the face of lasting socio cultural dominance of the global west and examines the effect of this struggle on human life and society there has been insightful work on how language works as a medium through which colonial especially in india studies that do engage with material culture and post colonial theory study it through a lens of archaeology in order to understand how colonization and globalization transform material culture in terms of actual materials used by people inhabiting colonial worlds this work endeavors to introduce to this framework the element of power in a pragmatic and anthropological sense the proposition that colonization and globalization not only changed the nature and volume of material objects used by former colonies they also transform the way we think about some material objects becomes important here uh in the recent past uh <clears throat> okay um yeah so that i, I mean the, this tendency uh, so 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 where do i see uh, uh, uh going ahead uh, what um i want to do is that uh because uh, this the, the legal illegal binary and because the way uh, we have constructed uh, the way uh, cannabis has been constructed through these years and because the way we have started thinking about cannabis uh, what has happened is that cannabis has become overtly influential and uh, because of this uh, illegality of cannabis my work has shown that uh, um, uh, uh, ch such channels are created uh, through uh, to this prominent drug dealers from cities just because cannabis is Ill illegal prominent drug dealers uh, get into himachal pradesh get into kullu get into shimla and it is this drug dealers that not only smuggle cannabis but then through these channels we also have other bigger drugs we have drugs like heroin we have drugs like chitta we have drugs like you know lsd that come come through these channels so once a public secret is created and the public secret once it makes conditions uh, you know favorable for a particular illegal object to get in right uh, or a particular illegal object to be produced right uh, it's 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 very ironical to think that you know that that, that cannabis is produced here it's uh, you know it, uh, charas is produced here and still uh, one needs external drug dealers to sell cannabis within himachal and the problem is that when these external drug dealers sell cannabis they also tend to sell more other more profitable drugs and uh, this is why i think that uh, this uh, you know the way we are looking at cannabis you know only through this particular narratives that are given to us by west it has been largely harmful uh, to the society and uh, <clears throat> i think uh, you know uh, uh, changing the framework we look at it uh, the way we look at it you know when we look at cannabis when we study cannabis uh without adhering to this framework i think we may produce forms uh, we may pr produce knowledge uh, that will help us to make it uh, make a much informed policy 
right so let us not talk about legalization i mean which is uh, you know which which is a which is a common uh, 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 language to be used with cannabis uh, my work suggests that we have to look beyond legalization we have to actually now start constructing a policy and this policy should not be based on guilt should not be based on uh, you know uh, on this uh, on uh, uh, on guilt that we are legalizing an illegal substance because uh, uh, we are not we shouldn't look at it like that because the, the more guilt comes into policy the more uh, problematic it becomes so uh, so so that is where i see this project uh, coming and this is where i think uh, my uh, project here at iss should feed into so, so, so I think uh, with this, I'll stop my presentation and I look forward to your feedback and your questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Prasanit, for this very, very interesting presentation. Like uh, whenever we uh, talk about cannabis, there are certain set ideas and myths associated with it, but you have explored altogether different dimensions related to it, understanding it beyond those terms of legality and the moral framework and all. So I open the house for converse, uh, the questions. So I invite questions from different fellows, please. You can ask questions. So uh, yeah, first question is from Dr. Makram Franjpeji. Uh, yeah, just a brief comment, uh, and then I will uh, probably exit from this. I mean, this was what I was, one of the things that I was highlighting was uh, the methodological question, what happens when we ask uh, not decolonizing cannabis, but let's say cannabis and Swaraj, you know, that's my first question. Suppose we, because you mentioned Hind Swaraj and I worked on uh, the idea of Swaraj, the reason I bring it up is since that's exactly what I was suggesting in the beginning, the moment you say post colonialism or decolonization, you're always coupling it with that history of colonization. There is no uh, you know, non-reactive and independent or autonomous methodological space, theoretical space, from which you can mount this inquiry. And then you get uh, into a kind of regressive loop when, uh, you know, uh, even in resisting, you're still colluding, you know, something like that. That's why if you said Swaraj and cannabis, then it would, I think, shift the focus, could shift the focus a little bit. Because Swaraj is also Swaraj in ideas, as Kisi Bhattacharya said. And I'm, I'm just looking it up with knowledge, because I, I thought you mentioned knowledge at the end. You know, these uh, substances were also a way of learning. They were heuristic, uh, you know, just as mescaline and other such substances. Even, even Aldous Huxley used uh, LSD. Uh, and uh, many communities, I was in Brazil, and they used uh, these substances under supervision, under very uh, well-defined conditions, uh, to open up some doors of perception, if you use that phrase, from Aldous Huxley. So my 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 uh, question to you was: I, I completely I completely resonate to your idea of getting out of the legal, illegal, moral, immoral framework. Merely that, though, that's absolutely. Uh, as you also rightly said, that sometimes it's just a door from cannabis to chitta. It's just a hop, step, and jump away, and the same dealers, etc. So that's very well put. But uh, if for a moment uh, we uh, leave that aside, the question of knowledge, methodology, swaraj, and substances is a, is a fascinating area. So that's all. I just wanted to say that you can take it up if you like, or you can come back to it later. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Raju has been, uh, yeah, please send a message long time back to ask the question. Yes. Please, Raju, sir. Thank you. Uh, I have a lot of issues. To start with, you're talking about post-colonialism. Now, as you mentioned, Taras, Ganja were banned only in 1986. In my youth, they were freely available. And uh, they were selling in the uh, main shopping centers. So it is not post-colonial. <clears throat> All right, it is something which has happened much later. It's not that something happened during colonialism and something changed later. All right, we made a change around 86 because of, I don't know, completely misplaced perceptions. 
The second point is that cannabis, any form, is not addictive. This has been established. I remember when I was 17 years old, one of my friends was a doctor and he had a huge bet with me. And then finally he studied all his pharmacological books and finally agreed that, yes, you are right, it's not addictive. Now, because it was not addictive, therefore the British had no use for it. Therefore the colonial powers had no use for it. So look at opium. Opium was a huge thing. All your Tatas and so on, they made their money out of it. The opium wars, how they enslaved China. So opium is very highly addictive. And as a matter of fact, when they sell this, they used to sell this charas, they used to dip it in opium in order to make it addictive. This used to be the common thing to do. So that's the part that it was not addictive, it was not harmful, and therefore they had no use for it. But we somehow did something and why we did that, that I think is something which needs to be analyzed. That what was that colonial pressure which existed in the 1980s, which made us ban that. Hmm? Now the third point I think is that, uh, you see, these are basically, they are hypnotics. As uh, Makaran said, they open the door of perception. If you have had that, I had plenty of it. And when you have that, you see the kind of experiences that you have, they are not something which you can forget. It's something you'll remember all your life. It's so vivid. All right, it is so vivid that you just cannot forget it. Even after 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, you just keep remembering that. So I think that they do alter perception and they give you something which you cannot so easily get by other means. And that is why the chat objected to it. See, there is also the idea of equity. When do you have bhang? You have bhang during holy. All right. Now, this has two functions. First of all, they are primarily hypnotic. All right. They are primarily hypnotic, but they also work as aphrodisiacs. The second point is that you have bhang and holy because holy is a function of equity. Right? You throw colors, you do this, and so on. And there is no distinction maintained between one person and another. And you have free sex, and so on and so forth. So this idea was contrary to Christian morals. And I think this is the point we need to make that decolonize what I make, that decolonization is all about getting rid of church superstitions. It's no, where is the morality in it? Is it equity? What is immoral about it? Okay, having a hypnotic, what is immoral about it? Advancing your perceptions, what is immoral about it? Right? So you cannot talk about it in those kinds of moral terms, but it is immoral from a certain church perspective, basically because the church was against equity. I think Makran was asking, hey, I don't want to go to a Jannat where there is no equity, only Christians will go or only Muslims will go or only somebody will go. Exactly the point. There is no such thing in a Hindu heaven that only Hindus can go. You know, Duryodhan goes and Yudhishthira goes and everybody goes to hell and heaven. So I think that uh, we need to understand that this concept of equity, and this is, you see, this was part of the process. If you've studied the Neoplatonic philosophy, you studied what Egyptians did. So they used to use these drugs precisely for enhancing experience, right? You have a very dramatic, you know, something, a drama, precisely a drama. And you have that under the influence of these hypnotics, it has a lifetime impression. It completely changes your mindset. So I think that uh, these aspects need to be looked at. Why was it that the, okay, why did they bother about opium? Why were they so keen on opium? Because it was addictive, this was not. And this has equity, and that equity is what people object to, and it's an aphrodisiac, and that is please. <laughs> I will uh, look at uh, the ideas of equity, and uh, I, I, I haven't come across this. I think this is a very uh, this is something I, I I need to explore as I uh, as I go ahead. And again, uh, citing Bruno Latour, it's yeah, it's, it's again going back to the Western ideas to to in fact when we are in fact talking about decolonization. Yes, I I accept that there's there's something which is uh, um, 
in that. And, uh, yes, uh, although uh, in 1986 it did become uh, we we illegalized it in 1986. <laughs> uh, uh, it that the legacy was from you know for it, it was in 1962 that we were given 25 years so that to illegalize cannabis. Uh, the the UN um, there was a UN there's a meet at the UN uh, at the United Nations UN OTC at the Office of Drugs uh, where it was decided that. Uh, Cannabis is a harmful drug and it, it should be banned. And we were giving even 25 years. And uh, then, and this. But how, 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 what is the evidence that it is harmful? Exactly. The, the, I mean, uh, the, the kind of uh, science that they. Um, uh, it, 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 it was, uh, the evidence was more discursive than scientific, even at that time, uh, because the way cannabis was looked was with suspicion. Uh, you know, it was, uh, it was something which was. Um, uh, which was uh, supposed to be bad because we don't know about it. And yes, uh, they, they didn't cite much but scientific evidence. We do know about it, right? The people have been studied because Bhang has taken traditionally and pharmacology books mention it, that people have been studied for over 25 years and they show no kind of withdrawal if they are taken out. So this is there in pharmacology textbooks. And this is there from uh, the 60s and 70s. So how is it really decided? It is viewed with suspicion. That part yes. I see, but there is no evidence. And I think we need yeah. to look at the evidence part. And uh, it is not uh, something which is that it's not like LSD. The LSD is dangerous. LSD, yes. you can have a kickback and so on. But it's not like that. Okay. Uh, yeah, there were two questions by uh, Dr. Chahal and uh, Dr. Alka. But uh, uh, because of uh, the end of our first session, so we can't uh, uh, see the questions. So can you please send your questions again? And in the meanwhile, uh, Dr. Hitendra Patel wants to ask a question. Uh, sir, please unmute your mic. Prashanjit, uh, I, I think you should consider yourself lucky that uh, Professor Raju responded that way. Because th these are the things, I, I, I may not be able to articulate uh, those kind of things the way Professor Raju has done. But this is a very important thing for uh, you as a researcher. <laughs> it will help you. Uh, I, I was, <coughs> I, I'm of the opinion that uh, if you really want to go for a kind of decentralization <laughs> or reclaiming or whatever, you will find that our approach should be different. And that approach requires a, a, a kind of rethinking about it in a different way. And that is why I, I find uh, some sociologists uh, trying to come out of it through the channel in which uh, they get entrapped once again in one form or the other. So bringing Latour into it and various other kind of things, I mean, <laughs> Rajiji has uh, pointed out those things. Uh, but I would say that let us begin with simple questions. What was the condition? And what were the real condition, I mean, uh, regional context of it? And here I would like you to draw attention to some historical works in which even national or uh, imperialism, colonial, those kind of things are not actually brought into the discussion. This, there is a great history of uh, regional uh, development of various kinds. And here I think uh, uh, your bringing Hari Shankar Parsai deserves to be appreciated. Because he says that dangerous things, if it gets internalized, then it becomes more dangerous. And that is where I think uh, 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 social scientists of your generation should try to understand it differently. I know social science has its own limitations. It has to bring in the theoretical frameworks, which are normally uh, I mean, appreciated ones, you are loaded with those guys. I mean, you bring in a lot of other concepts which are recognizable in the West. But let us try to see a simple history of cannabis in that region. And you will find a large number of evidences coming your way 
and that will not only bring in the context of colonialism but even pre-colonial times and that is where i think this 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 uh, imperial national sort of a thing becomes somewhat inadequate in your case even even lit you can find regional literature or traditions in which these kind of reflections can be found i can think of rahul shankitya he has written something uh, related to that in which this buddhist tantric tradition uh, use of use of different kind of materials which all of all of a sudden became somewhat somewhat diff uh, different and these things were these were these things were started to be seen very differently so this this project requires some bit of some bit of uh, i should say uh, um, reformulation and, and, and in that context, if you bring simple questions, regional history, uh, literary reflections and all that, then that becomes easier for you to, to say uh, that uh, uh, these, uh, these things had, these materials had a history which is not informed or tainted by or influenced by the gaze you are talking about. I mean, Shiva, शिव शिव के उपासक जो हैं वो गांजा गांजा पीते हैं और भांग खाते हैं एंड देयर नथिंग रॉन्ग इन दैट अमृतलाल नागर ए ग्रेट फ्रेंड ऑफ हरिशंकर परसाई कभी भी बगैर भांग खाए लिखते नहीं थे हां हमारे राष्ट्रपति जो है वो खैदी खाते थे लास्ट तक भी गांधीन होने के बाद भी खैदी खाते थे दीस आर सिंपल थिंग्स दीस आर सिंपल थिंग्स एंड दैट इज वेयर that is why you are you are bringing that interesting uh, example in which you talked about the coming of smugglers and their 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 uh, attempts to make use of this kind of market and then bringing their own materials for more profit that becomes very significant so this is this is not something which is really are connected with uh, colonialism or something of that sort i think as a historian simple historian there are two kind of historians one is great historians and i am a simple historian so i ask simple questions i want you to see the regional records or regional uh, sources to tell the story the way people can understand I, i this is how i respond but i i like the idea itself where you are you are thinking of uh silence of 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 cannabis it's a wonderful uh, term i mean i'm i'm familiar with french lit french historical take on that how how you you can actually uh see those spaces where from uh, one flower becomes less important and rose becomes more important is it even in flower even even in 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 in, in some kind of objects Englishmen came and they they made it more popular, and then new in English people, new Indians, they came and and they they tried to follow their masters, do, whom they had they they claim they have driven out, and they became double enraged to use Ramachandra Ji's word, which I admire. So I I think I I, I have just tried to I have just tried to follow what Professor Raju has said. and this may sound bit odd or or bit rude also but uh, this is the time when we we expect some some new kind of work with simple questions and a very different kind of treatment and then we may have something very extraordinary coming from your side thank you thank you thank you thank you for that uh, feedback yeah i i will be uh, looking at it for sure yeah uh subhu ji wants to ask and please go ahead subhuji thank you and am i audible yes ji ji yeah this is a very interesting theme and i really hope to learn a lot from this uh i am just disturbed by the kind of binary of what you call indocentric and uh, west western duality you know i think uh, if i is talking about indian perceptions of intoxicants of various kinds uh, there's a wide range you know, of acceptability and unacceptability different sections of the society uh, whether you have the orthodox 
Brahmanic sections, with the heterodox sections. Even within Islam, you have the Basharia and Basharia people using intoxicants. Uh, various sections of the society looking at it differently. And I think it is the internal differentiation and uh, building of a certain elite nationalist culture, which is trying also to be in tune with the colonial thinking, which creates a mindset which fructifies in 80s, you know, like what you mentioned. So I think we need to problematize or at least uh, look at the Indianness or the Westernness in much more nuanced way, so that we have a much more enriched perception of the debates happening. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, uh, the the term Indo-centric uh, needs to be problematized more because uh, in India itself we have different ways to look at Kerala. Thank. You. Yeah. That will be something which will. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So uh, there is a question by uh, Dr. Alka. So Prasanjit, you can read from here. One thing to what Subhu said that it is not just Indo-centric. See, Egyptians systematically use these drugs all right so this is neoplatonic it is sufi and it is indian so it is not indocentric i think and the maya use these drugs they used uh, similar things so i think that uh, calling it indocentric is uh, not the right thing all right it is not anywhere in the picture colonialism yes rest against the rest yes but not Indocentric. Yeah, so, so Alkaji asks, uh, have you come across use of cannabis still prevailing in the pre-colonial framework in our communities, uh, remote of urban, uh, without the post-colonial uh, allege of uh, guilt? Um, uh, uh, sadly, I, I mean, uh, I haven't, I have, uh, Although I have uh, traveled to uh, to Malana or to or through villages which 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 have been you know which have been, which can be considered to be very remote, uh, but uh, the, the the adage of guilt uh, it it uh, it is constantly there, except uh, in uh, elderly uh, like uh, 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 when when you sit with say someone who is seventy five years or or eighty years old in Malana or in other parts of Parvati or even in the higher uh, regions of Parvati Valley. Uh, you know, in, in the villages of Grand Vagara, that time there is hardly any guilt involved. It's just, uh, it's just, it's, 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 it's like drinking tea. You just go and sit. Uh, uh, with the with the younger crowd, uh, you you'll always find there's something, uh, you know, uh, which is uh, which uh, which which is produced from that sense of you know that you are doing something which is immoral, but not with the elderly, uh, especially in the villages. Uh, like Malana or other villages. So, so there are uh, there is a, there are groups of people where I have uh, come across that. Yeah, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Uh, Raplam and Ujjain, these are very major centers which produce both cannabis and poppy. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, if there is no other question, I can take this privilege of asking a question. So, yeah, uh, actually, uh, Prasenjit, my question is uh, uh, related to, I mean, in Punjab these days, you know, there is a debate going on that uh, uh, there should be legalization of opium that because of all this chitta thing and uh, heroin and all. So uh, the argument behind it is that it's an organic drug as compared to the chemical drugs prevalent. So how do you see it? I mean, if if not cannabis and other, but in context of opium, that legalizing it and uh, understanding it beyond the moral or that framework, you know. Uh, can I just uh, you, add Dr. Chahil's question, which is related to this? I mean, his question, which has vanished from the chat box, okay, okay. was how do we handle the problem of intoxicants and the drug menace in I think he has Punjab and Haryana in mind. And he is basically concerned about this question about uh, how do you handle the problem of intoxicants and its use. I think that was the essence of the question, the detailed wording I forget. 
so so opm uh, so I'll, uh, opm is a different ball game altogether and uh, although i haven't studied opm uh, uh, to a great extent but uh, from what i have studied uh, even in its most organic form opm uh, is harmful because it makes you physically dependent on it so the withdrawal system of uh, the withdrawal of opm uh, uh, especially even in rajasthan if you see uh, 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 opm has huge withdrawal effects uh, so, uh, so 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 uh, opm becomes a different ball game we need to also uh, you know uh, we need to have rules to um, restrict uh, the amount of opm that is consumed because uh, opm is highly addictive because it's physically addictive it makes you physically addictive unlike cannabis so 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 so, so i mean that is a little problematic and yeah. and and dr chahal's question uh, um, it's a it's 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 a uh, the, the thing is it's it's a question that uh, you know that that uh, um, that doesn't have a simple answer you know i mean this says so much and and different regions need to be looked at i think in different uh, um, there's no uniform answer to that uh, because punjab has its own problem uh, and people are coming out with solutions like the aap uh, legislature from punjab has asked to uh, legalize cannabis in punjab so that it could reduce uh, the effect of other drugs now that is something that 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 can be definitely looked at uh, i think and uh, you know and, and, and that is where cannabis policies definitely should look at and and, and that is that is my answer but uh, again the different regions would need different uh, sort of interventions uh, for example northeast would need completely different interventions or uh, uh, like manipur or nagaland would need completely different interventions or himachal and uh, and punjab and haryana although they are neighboring states uh the forms of addiction in these states is uh, is not the same even in neighboring districts the forms of addiction are not same so so that question needs to be addressed in a very um, in the more in a, in a in, in a more contextual way. thank you yeah. any other question from anyone i don't uh, sir please unmute your mic perhaps venusa has asked a question uh is it a merely a legal or a moral question something of this sort mm. yeah i i i just so okay there is this question by uh yeah uh what is the fundamental difference in perception or gaze of cannabis between formerly colonized societies and non colonized societies yes uh, uh the differentiation has to be made more in terms of uh those societies which have been traditionally using cannabis versus those societies which haven't been using uh, cannabis and uh those uh, colonizers who have taken cannabis from uh, from the middle east and from uh, south asia and and the way they have been looking at cannabis all these years and uh, they have been very fast about it they uh, they legalize it and now they are looking at Ill, uh, uh, you know and they, uh, they they make it illegal and then they look at legalizing it so 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 the way they treat uh, cannabis is, is 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 completely separate from 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 its uh, uh, from its uh, social and cultural context they, they 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 have made their own context out of this particular substance uh, so they have uh, attached the spirit of rebellion with cannabis with uh, with the 1960s and 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 the thing is uh, they have explored they, they had less time to explore the substance and uh, the way uh, they have uh, the every day the banality of use is absent in those societies uh, uh, the, the everyday use that, that that we have in in many of our areas even now uh, the, the fact that it is used in medicine uh, the, the 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 ritual use uh, the fact that it is used in, uh, in 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 some religious uh, uh, you know functions so so these uses uh, are absent uh, in in, uh, in the uh, in western context although they have made their uh, they have constructed their own context around this uh, around the substance so, so yeah there is a question by uh, dr prohit also so you can read from him uh, cannabis in my state has been in used as spice fiber for coats i think it's uttarakhand mm -hmm. medicine to cure the sting of hornets and now acute for containing sugar disease uh the the state government has an open 
The, the state government has an open policy to promote cannabis cultivation. Only the dope hashish byproduct is declared as a contraband. Yeah, the Uttarakhand has uh, legalized uh, 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 cannabis cultivation, uh, but it says that it won't be used as intoxicant, which is again, uh, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's. Uh, I don't know how that will be feasible because uh, with opium we have seen that uh, in Rajasthan. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, what has happened is that uh, in Neemach, for example, they said that they will be growing opium for medicine, uh, but then it is it's very difficult to you know uh, compartmentalize its use. Uh, although, for example, opium has been used as uh, has been growing has been grown for medicine, but uh, uh, the same stuff from Neemach is supplied to most of Rajasthan for uh, uh, getting intoxicated or for getting high. So I think it's very difficult to compartmentalize compartmentalize or differentiate uses uh, uh, in, in most of this because something which is grown for cannabis uh, with something which is grown as the medicine will also be used for enjoyment which is also be used for other purposes so 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 i am a little uh, uh, with the i think they have recently done that in one year back they have done that. Yeah. okay Present. yes sir I was Sir, your voice is not clear. Yeah. So your voice is breaking, actually. Yeah. Okay, okay. The... okay. Even he has vanished. Forget about the voice. <laughs> <laughs> now we can see him. Please, sir. I'm there. Yeah, yeah, sir, please go ahead. Should I sir? Voice is breaking. Please. Keep it going. Yeah. Uh, no, actually, your voice is not at all. Uh, uh, I mean, I can't hear your voice. No uh, mind. Uh, Thank you. What are you so? Yes, sir, 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 you are not audible. Uh, 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 can we discuss it when, yeah, yeah, in person, like whenever we meet or? Uh, okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question? One last question. How yes, much sir, have you please. tried cannabis? <laughs> <laughs> what is your personal experience? <laughs> So, I, so I, 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 I like, I mean, since I've, I, I stayed there for a long time uh, as a part of ethnography, so I, 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 of course I had to, I, with, with all my friends, with all the, with everyone. So, so yeah, yeah, I had to, because if you don't uh, uh, have it with them, you, you are, uh, 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 you are a suspect of being an undercover policeman. So, you know, <laughs> so, so it's, uh, and it was a good experience. I mean, frankly speaking, it was a very good experience. I'm not the speaker. <laughs> okay, I think we don't have any more questions. There are so many, but uh, I, I think uh, I have already spoken. And uh, uh, what I would be doing was, was to going to repeat what I had said, but I'm really concerned about it because you see, once you take that kind of vision, and you start looking at this entire thing as their society or this society. The, the, the entire thing looks very different from that. And that is what I say, I, and I keep saying, particularly to young and promising social scientists, that let us look it afresh. Let us look it, uh, uh, don't say that uh, 
North East society or Assamese society as Manipur society is, is, is has a different kind of <clears throat> understanding of this or Naga society uh, is like that. I mean, let us try let us try to go to the local, <clears throat> the, 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 the site where from things are seen. If you go to Uttarakhand, this, this, you, you, are, you have done a uh, fair amount of work to the extent of... In fact, in fact that was exactly my point. That yeah, was exactly because, my point. Because, yes. because yeah. when you said that unless, unless that exactly you, you, you become part of yeah. this, when you said that unless, unless you become part of that, Clifford Gears has given uh, a very good example that unless and until you become part of their practices and their social uh, kind of practices, you are not seen as insiders. So they would not reveal their, their secrets, which they actually carry with them. So that is where I think the story has a local uh, local angle. And once you start doing that, then the entire treatment becomes very different. You do not look, look through the categories which are circulated in the Western academia. And that is where you actually bring in some new elements into it. And that is why I, I, I always object to, or in fact try to object, I, I, my objection does not carry much weight, but I try to object to that, uh, try to develop our own categories. And that is where I think the problem uh, becomes very interesting for uh, for any new academy, I mean, uh, new generation academic skills. Once you problematize the whole thing, this imperial, this national, all these categories tell story in a very limited way. So let us uh, let us discuss about the possibility of uh, bringing some new categories into it, and that will make your work more um, what should I say innovative or something more interesting to 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 us. This is what I was trying to reiterate again and again. Thank yeah, you, yeah. I like the idea. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, there is another question by Dr. Chahal. So please go ahead with this. Uh, while congratulating for your intro presentation and also wishing all success for your project, may I ask you another question? My question is, what is your understanding about your so-called Indian meaning of decolonization and how is it uh, different from uh, uh, Brahmanization? So uh, I don't think there's a, uh, there, uh, there's a particular Indian meaning of uh, decolonization. Uh, I, I mean, as a concept, uh, that is one thing that I, that I will be exploring more as I as I go ahead. Uh, its relation to uh, Brahmanization is uh, is something which uh, first of all, I I need to understand what Brahmanization as a process. Uh, uh, I mean, because. Uh, I mean, what is uh, uh, Brahmanization as a process? And and the relationship between decolonization and Brahmanization, I'm not able to make it as of now uh, while I'm answering your question, but I'm sure uh, as uh, as I get into it more and more, I think I will uh, uh, be able to, uh, you know, I will be able to. If any permits, I would love Professor Chahil to come in and say what what does it mean by Brahmanization and and bringing this question into this whole discussion. Uh, I, I let me let me intervene here. Bhang is used by Bhangis. There is no question of Brahmanization here. So uh, I think. Uh, uh... Yeah, there are no more questions except one question which we missed is uh, by Dr. Alka to Dr. Raju, sir. Uh, but was, what is your experience? <laughs> I was just joking because we miss Dr. And Professor Raju so much here. I was yes. joking with him. <laughs> Professor, Chahal has, Professor Chahal has joined. Professor Chahal has joined. Chahal is here. Please uh, go ahead. Ah, well, uh, Dr. Raju, I'm I'm totally different with your meaning. You have also very strong perceptions about it. You, 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 can't hear you. do not know, but it is actually, but actually the meaning of Bhangi. 
you don't know about it and you always always intervene in these things you so you know for your kind information may i may i tell you what does the term bangi mean bangi means a broken man okay does it not mean that the people who used to you know use bhang so you have to read you have to read about the things you have to read thoroughly about the dalit studies you even don't know abc about the dalit studies and you sir, are sir, sir sir we, we we would love to so, this is wrong this is wrong professor raju as a conventional I, meaning I, of bhangi as one who consumes bhang and this meaning was not invented by dalit studies so let us tell you that it existed it's a traditional meaning which has existed and you don't have a right to just talk about it and say it is wrong i think it is right uh so i would like uh, to, to, to intervene there yeah, yeah sir sir don't mean let let me complete the the term bhangi means the people who were broken from the mainstream society from the various regions okay so this does the, the, the term bhangi does not mean the people who used uh, to you know use this uh, so called uh, uh, this bhang and uh, other things okay sir uh, dr chan please come to the second part of your question also which uh, uh, yeah please ah, yeah, yeah. now 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 please uh, uh, dr prasanjit Are are you hearing me? Yes, yes, yes. I can hear you, sir. So you could not understand the my term uh, Brahmanization. You know, this is I I use this term huh. for the process, the the ongoing process which is going throughout the you know India nowadays. Huh. Everything in the in the name of colonization or so-called decolonization. Everything which has been put on the you know board is actually. Nigeria. So I just want you will. We will also discuss in detail because you are my room roommate also. So so you have to you have to also be very careful about. Yeah. Uh, or uh, what actually you are meaning is. Okay. okay. Yes, yes. I understand. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, feedback because I understand it's. Uh, 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 that uh, I mean that. Uh, there is there might be conception that decolonization uh, means what you refer to as brahmanization and there is a uh, I, there is a need to actually uh, you know uh, to differentiate between the uh, between the two and uh, yeah i take your point yeah i i will give you i will i will also give you many insights yeah. you know from me thank okay you. sir sure. thank you thank you so much uh, i would thank like to make an observation here i think it is going too far to call decolonization as brahmanization now it is one thing that certain groups support the church and they think that whatever the church did was very good all right now decolonization has nothing to do with this process of brahmanization it's a confusion of categories total confusion of categories without any understanding of what the process is and an attempt to try and fudge issues and bring everything into one domain i object to it very strongly i also i also have strong uh, objections from your perceptions you also always intervene in everything dr raju i have strong acceptance of your intervention we can, can carry on the discussion later on you know about the literature and you become a very you know huge scholar of everything dr chahal i think we can carry on with this discussion yeah am i am i audible am i audible dear you for... intervene in everything You do not know even about. Yeah, you know, I think this discussion is not about me. Please stop making personal remarks. Sir, 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 sir. more questions, please. Can we? Uh, yeah. I do not know even the meaning of bhangi. Can I speak something? Uh, Who is it? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Doctor Prohit, please uh, care. go uh, ahead. My observation is. Am I audible? Yes, 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 yes sir. sir. <laughs> भांग की इतनी बढ़िया बढ़िया परिवार छे छे शब्दों में कम हो और जिसने भांग पीना शुरू किया साठ साल से ज्यादा नहीं बचता है ये अच्छी चीज नहीं है दिस इज माय ऑब्जर्वेशन थैंक यू थैंक यू सर ओके सो या तो संजीत यू वांट टू कमेंट ऑन इट Yes, yes. No, but uh, just say. I mean, I think Himachal. Me, I've I've seen very uh, 
it's a different uh, because uh, I've seen people grow very old while smoking or drinking bang. So yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah. so I think we don't have any more questions. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining and uh, for the feedback. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for yeah.